Good morning, everyone. Hope you're having a great day. Today has been a whirlwind so far, and it's only um, 9 a.m. Eastern time. So, we just got back inside from a nice long walk. It is snowing outside in New York City, finally. I love going outside in the snow. Good morning, Julie, welcome. The snow is um, fun and invigorating and it's nice. I posted a little, we went, went on, on a 10 or 15 minute walk. I posted a video of that on Instagram earlier today. I can't take my whole computer with me, otherwise I would have taken all of you with me. But um, it's good, it's important to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. A lot of people want to be pampered and I think you need to be strong instead. Sure, it's nice to be pampered, but get used to it. Louis Philippe says, good morning from Canada. Good morning, good morning Eric as well. And Clint and everybody's here. Um, I like the snow. I should probably move to Canada. They have more snow in Canada than they do in America. So while I was out there on my walk, someone asked me about confidence. They essentially said that they lack confidence at the poker table. What can they do about that? Where am I? I'm in New York City. It's where I live most of the time. Um, so confidence, right? A lot of people see some poker players and think that being overly confident, overly, um, I don't know, proud of the way they play, um, overly sure they're making the right play, et cetera, et cetera. They think that, um, that is how you're supposed to feel. In reality, those people, especially if they're not actually big winning players, are very often displaying false confidence. Or it's real confidence, but unjustified, right? If you are not crushing the games you're playing, you should not feel confident in them, right? It's important um, to, to develop confidence. I think if you are naturally someone who lacks self-confidence, which I naturally lack self-confidence, I don't know why. Maybe it's because I realize I'm not awesome. Um, if you naturally lack self-confidence, you need to make sure that you've developed a strong framework such that your decisions have essentially been pre-made for you by some framework that you cannot really mess up. And that is exactly what we try to teach over at PokerCoaching.com. We try to teach you a framework to play essentially all scenarios. Like, um, for example, continuation betting the flop, right? There's a framework in place such as, first question, do we have a range advantage? If we do, and it's a big one, you probably just wanna bet everything. Next, how much do we bet? That depends on the board's texture. As the board is more coordinated, you wanna bet bigger. As the board is really good for your range, like all high cards, you can bet big as well. If the board is uncoordinated, you wanna bet small, right? And you know this won't have you playing perfect game theory optimal poker, but it will have you playing pretty close to it, right? And then from there, you adjust based on how your opponent's gonna react. If you don't have the range advantage, you bet way less often. As your range advantage diminishes farther and farther, you go all the way down to betting 0%. And then you, when you do bet, you bet big. So that's typically the solid continuation betting framework, right? And, and that's what we try to teach so that you don't have to guess about what to do. Um, maybe some poker players out there think they're really good at guessing. I would much rather know the right play though, right? And if you can learn the right play in all the common situations, well, you're gonna be set essentially, right? Because then you're only gonna have to figure out the corner cases in game. And often you'll come up with either the best or the second best answer for that, which is good enough. I mean, if you've done the quizzes over poker coaching, you know you usually have four reasonable answers and or reasonable uh, answers to any poker situation. And then out of those four, only one or two of them are actually very good. And if you can get, just get very good at picking the best or second best answer, you're gonna crush it. You're excited for the homework answer today. Good, glad to hear that. What is an easy way to determine your range advantage compared to your opponents? Oh, Eric, that's easy. You have to study away from the table. In general though, main question is who connects better with the flop? Like say you raise under the gun and it comes seven, six, five. Well, obviously, if you're against a big blind caller, big blind caller has way more 7-6, 6-5, 7-5, 9-8, 8-8, 9-8, 9-8, 9-8, 9-8, 9-8, 9-8, 9-8, 9-8, 9-8, 9-8, 9-8, 9-8, 9
right? Your opponent has a lot of very good hands here. So your range advantage will be small or minimal or non-existent. Um, also, you want to take the nut advantage into, into consideration. As your opponent has the nut advantage, you typically want to bet small. As you have the nut advantage, you typically want to bet big. So say you raise under the gun and comes jack 5-5 five, five, and you're against a big blind caller. You have the range advantage for sure, but you do not have the nut advantage, right? Because in that scenario, your opponent has all the fives and you don't. How do you determine bluffing frequency? Typically, well, Justin, again, I'm not going to go through all this. We're going to discuss this in the poker coaching homework today. If you want access to that, you can sign up completely for free. You can join me today at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Typically, though, you want to make sure your betting range is balanced, and you want to make sure your checking range is balanced. And you do that by using specific ratios, which I'm sure we're going to be discussing later today. It's way easier when I have my range analyzer out in front of me, and all of you can see it. So anyway, confidence. The easiest way to develop confidence is to actually be good, right? If you're actually good, you have no reason not to be confident. Now, confidence is not cocky, right? I think a lot of people think having a lot of bravado or being arrogant is confidence. That's just being a jerk. Don't be a jerk. Um, that, that's just ridiculous. Don't be a jerk. Um, but yeah, so... The question was, do I ever lack confidence? And really, the only time I'm ever, quote unquote, lacking confidence is when I'm playing against the absolute best players in the world, who I very much respect. And I realize that they play better than me, right? I'm very good at being objective and realizing, okay, I probably play equally good or better than this person, or, okay, this person probably plays better than me. And it's important to understand that. And when that is the case, you need to make sure you're using a strategy that takes that into account. The fact that Let's say if I don't have a post-flop edge against these players because they're just better than me, I want to be making big pre-flop pots, right? Because that takes away their skill. Um, this comes up a lot whenever you get very deep in a tournament or when you get, let's say, heads up at the end of a tournament. If you are not a great, if you are, if, even if you are a good heads up player, and I, I would am confidently, confidently say I'm a very good heads up player, but you're playing against a world-class heads up player, what should you do? Well, you should adjust significantly. Um, the World Poker Tour tournament I won at Foxwoods, I was playing against Jonathan Jaffe, who at that time was at least in the top three heads-up sit-and-go players in the world. Probably number one. I knew this. I, on the other hand, could only beat $1,000 heads-up games. He was beating $5,000 heads-up games, so he was a notch better than me. I knew this. So what do we do? Well, he probably has better post-flop skills than me. So we play a pre-flop game. And interestingly enough, he told me years later that I had a gigantic edge over him in that specific match because when he would raise, I would just go all in for like 30 big blinds, you know, like a big shots because that takes away his biggest skill. And also he was waiting for spots where he would get to utilize that skill. And there were times where I would call pre-flop and then probably play suboptimally after the flop, right? So he was expecting that skill edge to come into play because he knew he probably played better post-flop than me, so he wanted to play post-flop. I knew he played better post-flop than me, so I took away that skill. Essentially, making the game into a flip instead of making the game into a situation where I'm going to slowly bleed equity, right? It's like if you go to the casino, people always say, well, I don't know if people always say this, but when you go to the casino, you would much rather make one big bet with all of your money that you're going to go gamble with instead of many small bets. If you go and you bet, a, say you go to the casino with $100, and you know I'm either going to win or lose this 100 I'm either going to double up or I'm going to go broke. If that's your mindset, you want to bet one time, because then you're 49% to win, which is great. If you bet $1 for five hours until you either double up or go broke, I don't know what the math is, but you may be like 30% to win. So it'd rather be 49% or 30%. And a lot of people are willing to trade the experience, the time at the table, for money. And to me, that's ridiculous. I don't really want some experience. I want to make as much equity as I can as reasonably quickly as I can. Um, Eric, though, the way you determine range advantage, simply put, is you run your preflop range against your opponent's preflop range, put in the flop, 
someone will have the advantage. Like say it comes ace, king, queen, and you raise under the gun against the big blind caller, you're gonna have like 60% equity. If it comes seven, six, five, you're gonna have like 50% equity. And you may say, how do you know this? How can you figure that out? Well, you, you run the math away from the table. What do you think of beyond tells training? I have no clue, I've never done it. Um, you're looking at playing the Colossal World Series, man. Do you have one of my coaches who I could recommend? Um, talk to Alex Fitzgerald or Matt Affleck. Both of those are very good players and they both have great success in small and medium stakes, large field tournaments. All right, what next? Realize that if you play better than your opponents, you have no reason not to be confident. Confidence is really a lot about perception. And it's important to understand that the way you view the world determines the way you feel, right? If you think everyone's out to get you and you think life is supposed to be hard, maybe you're, maybe people are out to get you. Maybe life is actually going to be hard for you. A lot of people try to live life on hard mode, right? And you don't need to live life on hard mode. Make things easy for yourself. You don't, you don't need to make life difficult. Make life easy and fun and enjoyable. It's up to you. And in terms of confidence, it's important to realize that it's a perception and perceptions are important. Um, so the, like I said, the only time I lack confidence is when I'm playing against the absolute best players in the world. And even then, it's not like I'm gonna whittle up and die. You know, it's, I'm still going to play my absolute best. And that's it, you know? And I, and I understand maybe we're gonna lose some tiny bit to these players, and that's fine. D. Nelson says, thanks for the recommendation on Daily Stoic. You feel like you're on the right track. Good, yeah, Daily Stoic's a good book to read every day. You see Alex Fitzgerald doesn't have a ton of live caches. That's because he's mostly an online player. He's played not a ton of live poker, but despite that, I think he's had an EPT final table, two WPT final tables. It's pretty nice whenever you don't play very much because you're a, an online grinder to show up and make final tables all the time. It's very important to realize that volume will drastically dictate whether or not results look good compared to others. Um, for example, like my last year or two, I really have not played a ton of live poker. Maybe, I don't know, 30 tournaments, if that. 30 tournaments is not a lot, but despite that, each year I've made a World Poker Tour final table, which is good, right? And we've had a few hundred K in caches. I mean, it's it, you have to make sure you understand whose results you're comparing them to. If you compare Alex Fitzgerald's results to someone else's results who plays eight tournaments, eight live tournaments a year, he's going to be killing it. If you compare him to a super high roller player who's playing 100 K per week, he's going to look like the biggest fish in the world. So it's always important to understand what you are comparing. Apples and oranges, right? They're different things. Oh, goodness. What's the most important thing to determine how much you should buy in for? Go to read, John, go read jonathanlittlepoker.com slash bankroll and read my book, Jonathan Little on Live No Limit Hold'em. We specifically discuss how much to buy in for. It mainly depends on the other player's stacks and skill, skill sets. Um, let's see. First time viewer, viewer, welcome, welcome. What's the differences between six and nine hand? Just assume it's six hand and the first few players folded. That's it. Isn't it illegal to use any mechanical devices at the table like a range analyzer? No, I don't know who would possibly tell you that. You're allowed to use your phone. You ever seen a place where they ban phones at the table? You have trouble when players lead into you. Study at pokercoaching.com. Apps to track return on investment. Use Excel. Excel is a very nice program that can do anything you want it to do. If you want to be lazy, you can use some app on the App Store, I'm sure. Let's see. It's hard to come down to play lower stakes. It's irritating. It's very important to understand that if you do not move down when things are going poorly, if you do not play within your bankroll, you're essentially saying, I am here to gamble and try to run up my stack quickly. A lot, a, lot of, uh, a lot of sites out there named Run It Up and Upswing and all these things where it makes it like, yeah, let's try to blast our money in and get rich quick. But, uh, no, we're not trying to get rich quick. We're taking it slow. I've seen people, some people do bankroll challenges where they start with like five buy-ins and try to run it up. I mean, if you do that, understand you're going to go broke a lot. So is it okay to go broke a lot? I remember whenever I did my quote unquote bankroll challenge a long time ago, I was taking it slowly. I was keeping at least 30 buy-ins and 
the bankroll was never at risk. We I think we tripled it up before I got bored because <laughs> I didn't really want to sit there and continue playing Tiny Snakes because uh, I have other things to do. But um, if you take it slow, you won't ever go broke. Not going broke is very, very powerful because you're always in action. It's very important to maintain the ability to make money. Double Barrel said he came in 13th out of 3,400 people. It's a big confidence boost. Yeah, I mean, that's another interesting thing, right? When people are running hot, they often think that they are great. And um, that's where a lot of people get false confidence, actually. Uh, I was very lucky that in my first year of live poker, I lost essentially every tournament I played. And that let me know I'm not the best in the world. So I made a point to always keep a big bankroll. I made a point to... Always try to study, always try to work hard. I made a point to not play humongous. And um, that's important, right? It's nice to get crapped on <laughs> because then you understand, oh, I can get crapped on. And then whenever you do have another big downswing later, it's not a shock, right? So many players win a tournament early in their career to get a lot of money. And let's say they end up with 500K from winning some tournament. Then they think, okay, now I'm a 10K player because I satellited into a 10K and I want it. Now I need to blast my money in. And... That's the exact opposite of what you need to do. You need to realize you're still a $10 tournament player. You just happen to have a gigantic bankroll. And you need to understand that you don't have the skills to compete there yet, so you need to continue studying. Actually, um, Scarmaker, who took third place in the Party Poker 20 million guarantee event, happened to study a lot for my sites. He gave me credit for helping him a lot. And I've been in contact with him since he won the 1.3 million from the $5 buy and he got in for and he's going to go play the World Series, and he wants to study a lot between now and then. So we're doing lots of coaching sessions, and we're getting him up to speed for live poker. And he's already, you know, putting in time playing the games I suggest he does play. He's a very good player. Um, I, I told him, like, he's perfectly fine playing, like, $50 buy-in tournaments online and Sunday Million-type tournaments with tons and tons of entries. Um, I think that's very good practice for specifically the World Series of Poker. And he's going to be doing that, right? He now has $1.3 million. He's going to invest essentially all of it, one million or so, buy a house with the other other a little bit, give some to his parents with the other little bit, and then have a hundred or two hundred K bankroll to play with. And I think that's very wise, right? And we're gonna make sure he doesn't make all the mistakes that I made. Because <laughs> I made and everybody else made. Everyone else has made. Ami says your experience with Alice Fitzgerald has been very positive. Excellent. Glad to hear that. Everyone has positive experiences with him. He's a very good coach. All right. You, Jared won a Club, w, Club WPT tournament last night. Congrats on that. Some people are saying they can't use their phones at some places. All right, get, get up and stand away from the table. Obviously, you can't use your phone during a hand. That would be ridiculous. Baby and Mom are doing great. Any major tournaments in their future? World Poker Tour Tournament of Champions and the Aria WPT in May. Just booked my hotel room, so that's fun. According to Matt Savage, you can't be on your phone when you're in a hand at a tournament. Yes, obviously. That's not what the question was. It's always important to read the question. The question was at the table, right? Make sure you read the question. Otherwise, you're going to give a wrong answer. Hope he pays taxes out of the 1.3 million. He is in a place where he doesn't have to pay taxes. How lucky is that? It's important to not have to pay taxes. That said, in America, they get you. You can analyze the hand after it's over, or more importantly, analyze it before it happens. If you analyze your hand before the hand takes place, then you already know the answer, right? All right, let's see what else I have here. All right, false confidence. We're going to talk now about the people who are obviously bad but think they're great. So the question is, do they actually think they're great? And I think a lot of the people who present an overly, I don't know, I don't even know the right word. Like charismatic is not the right word and gregacious is not the right word. People who act incredibly confident, I think, are almost always faking it and really have huge emotional issues where essentially... They are trying to compensate for the fact that they realize they are not good. <laughs> and if they realize they're not good, and they're acting that way, instead of going out and actually improving themselves, 
then they're making a big mistake. They're wasting their time. They're squandering their opportunities. If you're not good at something, then you need to instead get good at it, right? Don't act like you're the best. The idea of fake it till you make it, I think, is a pretty horrible idea because you're going to lead other people astray, too, especially if you're actually in a business that you know, where you're trying to help people. Like, imagine you're trying to be a doctor, be your crappy doctor, and you're going to go and you're going to operate on someone whose life depends on you, and you don't really know what you're doing, yet this guy right next to me knows what he's doing. Um, probably let the guy next to you either do it himself or help you and teach you, right? Don't try to do it by yourself. You need to understand that if you don't have the skills, you do not need to have an opinion. Or if you do have an opinion, your opinion does not matter. Something I, I was reading about in Ray Dalio's book, uh, what's it called? Man, it's, it's by my bed. Principles. Essentially, they rate all the people at their hedge fund based on the on their skill sets, right? They have like baseball cards where everyone has stats, or like in a video game where everyone has stats. And if you are very good at, let's say, math, and someone else is very good at, let's say, English, if there's a math problem, the guy who's very good at English, his opinion does not count. But the guy who's very good at math, his opinion counts a ton. And they're weighted, right? If, if everyone thinks one thing, maybe that could perhaps override the math guy. But um, usually it doesn't, right? You need to make sure you understand your skill set so that you are using your skills appropriately. You need to understand other people's skill sets as well. So I think a lot of people, especially in this world now where anybody can have a, a stream, right? Um, anybody can post on Twitter. People can post on Twitter anonymously. Anyone can have a Facebook account. And turns out everyone's uh, post is mentioned pretty much the same in terms of um, priority, right? Unless they get blocked for being obvious spam. Um, if everyone, everyone thinks their opinion is equally valid as everyone else's, and that is just not true. It's important to understand that, right? If we are talking about Game Theory Optimal Poker, for example, my opinion is more valid than almost everyone, except for I know the 50 or 100 people who know better than me, and I will default to them, right? For the longest time, I didn't do a whole lot of talking in terms of poker strategy and advice, right? I know I've been doing it for quite a while now, but um, there were four or five years where all I did was listen. And that's because I knew I did not know what I was talking about yet. You don't want to be giving bad information and leading people astray. Um, because, I mean, that's just unethical, right? You're not trying to lead people to danger unless you're a horrible person. Uh, the thing is, a lot of people, especially on the internet now, are trying to promote something that is based on false information. I mean, you see so many YouTube channels out there that just purely give detrimental information to people. And then that person is out there trying to promote their information so that they get views and they get ad sponsorship or whatever. They sell some product that leads people astray. And that's troubling, right? I mean, you can make huge predictions. You can say, um, the stock market's going to go up to, I don't even know what the stock market's at. Stock market's going to triple in the next year. And if it triples in the next year, you're going to look like a genius. But in reality, you were just lucky. Um, you can say whatever. Cryptocurrencies are going to go up. Put half your money into cryptocurrencies. And if they go up again, then again, you're going to look like a genius. And if they go down, well, eh, you know, I was just saying it. That's just what I say on my channel. And... You have to understand that people trust you and if people trust and respect you and they go and they put their net worth into the stock market and it goes to zero or cryptocurrencies and they go to zero, you have ruined lives, right? And you don't want to be out there ruining lives. So it's very important to only give advice on things you thoroughly understand. And now, if, the tough thing is I think a lot of people are so egotistical and so... They lack self-awareness so much that they think they're actually good at things. And that's when it gets really dangerous, right? Because knowing a little bit, it can get you in a lot of trouble. You fell victim feeling like a genius when you were just making a lucky guess. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Imagine you decide to make stock market investments and you decide to pick 10 stocks and they all double in the next year. You may think you're really good at this. 
Whereas in reality, if they're all 50-50 to do that, it's just, you know, monkey flipping coins. And inevitably, one of the monkeys is going to flip all the coins right. So be aware that you have to very adequately assess your skill set. And I mean, I adequately assess my skill set by having a huge sample, not 10, 10 hand sample or 10 tournament sample. I played many, many thousands of sit and goes. Gosh, I don't know, 50,000 of them before I started teaching people how to play sit and goes. Because I actually was confident then. I knew exactly what I was doing. I had a solid framework built and I knew how to transfer that information to others. In multi-table tournaments now, I have a huge uh, database of tournaments that I've played, right? And I have pretty good results. And I know a, essentially a framework, a formula to teach everyone to help them get better at poker. I'm just not someone out there running my mouth to try to get views, right? Understand that. It's very, very important to understand that faking it till you're making it may actually work, but it could also ruin the lives of people. Especially if you're giving um, financial advice or health advice or um, you know relationship advice, so be very very careful. Um, those are really the, the things that people will trust other people on because they're looking for a quick fix. Everyone's looking for a quick fix on their finances and they're trying to get in shape and they're trying to have good relationships and they'll listen to anything and they'll try anything, and especially if it looks like something is working. A lot of people will jump on the bandwagon, and it's a lot of variance, right? It's important to understand variance. All right, but yes, I did not talk. I did not give advice for four or five years until I was very, very good, and then I started giving advice. Only until you actually know what you are talking about should you be giving information. At least in my opinion, right? Again, a lot of people are out there to scam you. We're not out there to scam you. Not sure if this channel is about poker. Yes, this is about poker. You, you find yourself eventually, eventually losing. Has the gap between good and bad online players become tighter? Um, new players are still very bad, but yes, in general, most people are pretty good at poker now, especially in No Limit Hold'em. The only person winning is the site. Well, think about this. If everyone's, if no one has an edge, then yes, obviously, the only one winning is the site. If you have a skill advantage, though, you're going to win in the long run. And definitely, you can still win at online poker. I mean, people are winning at all stakes. All right, uh, Matt, it seems like you, do, you are not familiar with me. Go to jonathanlittlepoker.com, read every blog post there. We've discussed this thoroughly. All right, you have a friend who is okay, but has great confidence in his ability and thinks he's as good as anyone. He does not publicly display confidence. You think that mindset helps him. Oh, the problem with that is... Imagine you think you're great, but you don't act great, but you're not great. That's going to lead you to making bad decisions. What if I am adequately bankrolled to, let's say, play $10,000 tournaments, but my skill level is only that of a $50 tournament player? Well, I'm going to be making horrible decisions hopping in that 10 k because I'm just giving away my money, right? Does me thinking I am very good and as good as anyone, does me thinking that help me? It helps me get in a tournament and give away my money doesn't really help you make money, though. Um, overconfidence is a big problem, and I think that's something that plagues a lot of poker players. But to be fair, you may have to be a little bit overconfident to take your hard-earned money and gamble with it. <laughs> Either that or stupid. <laughs> Either that or just jaded. I don't know what the right word is. Um, naive. Because when we all started playing poker, we were all fish, right? And if you're a fish and you're willing to take your money and play with it, you must either be oblivious or you must be overconfident. But some people stay oblivious and some people actually learn and improve their skills. And listen, there's nothing wrong with gambling and playing and having fun. That's, that's what a lot of poker is. But at the same time, we are speaking here to players who are trying to better their lives and improve their lives and perhaps even become professionals. And to become a professional, you need to thoroughly understand where you fall in the pecking order. Thinking you are as good as anyone is clearly silly because you're not, right? There are definitively the best players in the world. It's well known who they are. It's not a secret, right? Are you as good as these players? Are you competing with these players on a regular basis? If you're not even playing in the games or games anywhere near that level, 
you're not as good as them. Sorry, hate to break it to you. It's just the truth. All right. When you run up your biggest stack, you have the most confidence that you tend to have. Yeah, I mean, people get confident, but that, again, that's just false confidence based on short-term results. All right. You know, something happened at Foxwood Poker Room 10 years ago where the big pros don't go there anymore. I don't know about that. Um, we want a tournament at Foxwoods. Let me find the trophy. Here it is. We won this, this thing at Foxwoods. This was one of their last um, tournaments. What year does that say? 2008. Here, we'll show everyone on Instagram. 2008. Um, this was a good one. I think I got uh, 1.05 million. Good, good payday. I'll just sit this right here. Um, what happened after that? This year, this tournament had, I think, 300-something people. The next year, it had like 200. The next year, it had like 100. Why did that happen? Lots of things happened. Borgata opened. Borgata became big. They started running poker tournaments. That took away a lot of the um, a lot of the players who would normally go to Foxwoods. Also, Foxwoods is kind of in the middle of nowhere. It's not a very good location. Also, it's in my opinion not as nice as a lot of the other places. Like Borgata at the time was just straight up nicer. Now they built an MGM tower at. Uh, Foxwood, so that's very nice. But um, there were better options is what it, what it amounts to. So given there were better options, it, the tournaments dropped off and dropped off. Actually, the last time I went there, they had a 10K. I think it only had like 100 people. I took seventh place. Oh, I was so sad. Was it seventh or sixth? Seventh or eighth? It may have been eighth. It was seventh or eighth. I remember I got it in for all the chips. Like, 70% of the chips in play. I had kings against ace-jack offsuit. And the ace came on like the turn of the river and I felt like I got hit in the face with a bat. Oh, it hurt me so bad. Marcel Luska in the house. Good morning. Well, it's good afternoon for you. Hope you're having a great day. All right. Learn and study till you make it. That is right. That is what you need to do. Great to see in here. You're still working hard and are given a better understanding of poker. Yeah, I mean... You have to understand that you are never going to be the best player in the world, unless you just happen to be lucky and you are. But you're probably not going to be, and so you have to continue working hard. You ever play live cash for a living? Yes. I played live cash from when I was 23 to 25, give or take, in Vegas. I went to Bellagio every single day, 12 hours a day, noon till midnight. I was there playing 510 or 1020. It was fantastic. Made about 10 big blinds per hour. You can do the math to see how that worked out. What's my biggest downswing in tournaments? 400K, which is about, I think it was about 80 buy-ins. You feel like you've been on a downswing for a while or you could just not be good enough to win. What do you recommend to get better? Studypokercoaching.com. Does the grind ever feel like work? It did feel like work, but um, then I realized I need to have better work-life balance. So instead of playing 12 hours a day every day for two years straight, I started not playing quite as much and enjoying life and doing other things. Any tips on how to loosen up the table without losing your tight image? No, not really. All right, let's see. Eric says you ordered, pre-ordered Modern Poker Theory. Yes, it's a great book. I'm very happy about that. That should be out at some point. Louis Fluke says the quizzes at Poker Coaching helped you a ton. You highly recommend them. I, I highly recommend them too. I only played 30 tournaments in two years. What is my in the money rate? I think I played 30 in each of the last two years, give or take, whereas I used to play like 70. Um, what's my cash rate? 60%. No, if you have a 60% cash rate, you're probably not playing very well. Um, also, that's, again, very, very short-term variance, right? I don't know my cash rate because honestly, it doesn't matter. What matters is return on investment, which has been at a pretty solid 50%. So, I mean... Not huge, but we're playing mostly high roller tournaments and 10Ks and 5Ks. So if we can pull 50% of those across the board, we're happy as we can be. And somehow it's been relatively consistent. That's mainly because I haven't had any huge score and I haven't had any like big downswing. I mean, you have no big scores, but no big downswings. You're going to have some small or some small negative ROI. And um, we've been lucky to make two final tables. It provided um, a few decent caches. 
Let's see. You love the Foxwoods Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> okay. Any thoughts on Short Deck Hold'em? I think it's another game that will be a trend. Um, no, I don't know anything about other people's Instagram post. You have to understand, I, I don't really have a ton of time to consume social media. I'm busy helping my family, taking care of a baby, and I'm busy making content for all of you. I look so silly when I'm staring at the camera reading. It's like, huh, what am I reading? Considering how long you've made a living playing poker, do you describe the advancement of poker strategy theory as dramatic or incremental? I don't know. People get better over time at all games. I, I'm not really so concerned with, um, I don't know, it's like, it just doesn't matter. Yes, pe people get better over time, and people get better faster over time, usually. When's my next tournament? Probably the World Poker Tour event, the Tournament of Champions at Aria in May, and they have a 10K right before that, so I'll play that too. And... Um, unless something comes up, I mean, if some site wants to throw me a bone, maybe I'll go play their big tournaments. But otherwise, I'm probably just going to stay home because, like I said, I have the, the one-month-old baby at the moment. It's Womack. Hello, Womack. Lots of questions. More than eight of you here. I think there are probably nine people here today. It's funny, actually. Someone told me, you should not uh, downplay the number of people who view your stream. It's clearly a joke. Um, every day we get many, many thousands of people who watch this, so thank you all for being here. I appreciate all of you. Sometimes my jokes don't come off very well. <laughs> All right, let's see. You've been on a downswing as well. But again, understand, like, what is a downswing? Understand, when you play tournaments especially, you're usually going to be down from your peak, right? If you look at a tournament player's graph, it's like slow decline, slow decline, and then a giant upswing. Okay, now we slow decline again. We're downswing, downswing. Then we have a big upswing when you win a tournament, right? When you win a tournament, your graph goes boop. And when you're losing tournaments, it trickles down. And then it goes boop. You can find, find graphs of tournament players online. It's pretty obvious. Or go to jonathanlittlepoker.com slash bankroll. There, you'll see a graph of a standard multi-table tournament player compared to a standard cash game player, which usually just goes straight up. So would you rather have your graph go straight up, or would you rather go down and then up every once in a while? You get to pick. Do you play high stakes online tournaments? Um, I do, but not as much as I used to, just because I don't think they're worth traveling for. And I'm in America, so it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to go do it. I mean, there are some tournaments that are, probably are worth traveling to, like Party Poker had the 20 million guarantee tournament that my student took third place in. Um, that's, that's definitely worth traveling to, but if the tournaments are high stakes but not large fields, it doesn't really make sense to go play. Again, that's just you playing against the other best players in the world, and you're not going to have much of an edge. It blows your mind that Chino has a backer. Look, Chino, I don't even know how he wins at tournaments. I just call him every time, and he's always bluffing. That said, he crushes it, man. If Chino had no money issues, I, I would definitely back him. I would have no problem with that. He plays great. I mean, quote-unquote, unquote, great. He plays super exploitative, and he's good at it. Probably not good with anything else pertaining to money, though. You're on an upswing this month, thanks to my help. Again... Everyone, stop caring if you're on an upswing or a downswing because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're on an upswing or a downswing. Just forget about it. Ever played at the bike? Many times. Someone's calling me. Have ever played at the bike? Many times I've played at the bike. Uh, they used to have a World Poker Tour tournament there. Or they still do have a World Poker Tour tournament there. Um, one time I was coaching Steve Beglider for the World Series of Poker main event final table. He doesn't play a ton of poker, but I tried to get him to play a decent amount between the the final table in the November 9, right? So he had a few months. I said, why don't you fly into Vegas? We'll drive from Vegas to LA together. We'll talk poker the whole way and see how it goes. We drove to LA and he took like seventh place in the main event. It was awesome. You're a smart man. I do my best. I've been beaten up enough. If you get beat up enough, you get smart. How should you figure out how to pay yourself from your bankroll if you're playing full time? Depends on what your expenses are. I talk about this in Jonathan Little on Live No Limit Cash Games. Let me show you. Uh, where is it? Where's the book? Oh, here it is. Jonathan Little on Live No Limit Cash Games. In this book, I explain everything you need to know about being a cash game pro. 
And the gist of it is, is you don't really need to quote unquote pay yourself. You need to figure out what your expenses are, keep them so low, as low as you can possibly keep them, and you know, take that out. Um, I don't exactly know where it is, but there's a section in this book where I essentially compare two players. One player who has no expenses or low expenses, like 1500 a month, the one who has like 5k a month expenses. And the guy who has 1500 a month moves up like twice as fast as the other guy. So keep your expenses low. The reason all the players who are roughly my age who started in 2002, 2003 did so well because they played in games that they knew they could beat for a large win rate and they had no expenses. I had like no expenses as a kid. I think I had like a thousand dollars a month expenses when I was making $20,000 a month, right? And when you're, when you're pocketing 19K a month, I mean, how are you not going to grow your bankroll super fast? Hello from Bolivia. You're a full-time grinder with four kids and you love watching. Well, good. Good luck. Probably hard to grind with four kids. Tolika meant online tournaments with buy-ins higher than 2K. Yeah, the party poker tournament was 5K. I mean, I will travel for stuff like that. But again, at this point in life, I don't need to play poker all day, every day. We have a thriving business teaching all of you to play poker. It's way better to help people than to only help yourself, in my opinion. And also, I have a family. I'm not trying to travel and be away from my family. I had a family to be home with my family, not to leave my family. There's still a ton of easy money online. I completely agree. You're on a downswing in the last month. Are you people just trolling me now? The fact that you are up or down does not matter in a month. Like I said, you will have winning and losing years in poker if you play enough. And if you just so happen to start playing and you happen to get a bad run right off the bat, you could just lose for a year and think you're the worst ever. Or you could just be on a huge upswing and think that you're the best player in the world and get overconfident, right? Funny enough, most people who start playing poker, who stick with poker, they often have a huge upswing right off the bat. And that's because if they went on a downswing, they would have went broke. Imagine you play poker five times and you just lose every time. You really gonna stick with that game? Probably not, right? You're gonna find something else. I didn't stick with basketball very long. I, I realized very quickly I was not very good at basketball. What's the best way to get in the game after a three year break? Study at pokercoaching.com, get up to speed and you will be good to go. Uh, let's see, you can't move up because you have so many expenses of a big family. Get your expenses low. Get them low. Very, very important. What games am I grinding with? What games were I grinding? Uh, I was playing, I don't know exactly what we're referring to. Um, back then I was playing $200 sit and goes, 200 to $2,000 buy in sit and goes. Mostly 200s though. Those ran all the time. The bigger ones ran only sporadically. Back on party poker, man. I love party poker. <laughs> they, uh, they probably love me too. Back then I was paying like $60,000 a month in rake, I think. Yeah, $60,000 in rake. So I was getting 20K profit from playing and then 20K in rake back. And uh, that's, that's pretty silly. What are my thoughts on Chino and his run? He, he, he's always winning. Good for him. What are my thoughts on staking, on his staking issues? I don't know. That's all um, hearsay, right? I'm a very big fan of not speculating and being a tabloid. Jonathan Little is not a tabloid. Like, essentially, I'm not going to say all other talking heads out there, but many of them, they like to talk about drama and things they don't actually fully understand. They also like dragging people through the mud when, you know, that person has never wronged me at all, right? I mean, Chino's never done anything wrong to me. He has been slow to pay one of my friends, but to his credit, huh, he actually did pay my friend back. It took him five years, but he did pay him back. So obviously he has issues, but I'm certainly not going to speculate, right? That would make me an unethical person. We're not trying to be unethical. What's the... Best fishiest casino to play during the World Series for two five cash games? Probably just the Rio. Maybe Caesars? Maybe MGM? Just survived your fifth heart attack. I think you need to get in shape. Downswings are irrelevant. Just improve your skills, yes. Gregory says, you'll teach me basketball and give me a private lesson. I have no desire to play basketball. <laughs> When is online poker going to be legal? Better question is, when's it going to be illegal? It's currently not It's currently not illegal in America. Everyone thinks online poker is illegal because they listen to the talking heads again. 
Online poker has never been illegal in America. What is illegal is for sites to accept transfers from banks. That is what is illegal. That said, um, they just are trying to upgrade the, I think it's the illegal wiring or the wire act or something like this. I don't even know exactly what it is. Talk to my lawyer, Mac Verstanding. He is actually in the fight to try to make this new change go away. Essentially, it's illegal for me to make a sports bet in another state. That is illegal, definitively illegal. It is not illegal for me to make a poker bet in another state, which is why these poker sites can, can share liquidity, right? Um, which is very important because otherwise there's no players in the field. So they're trying to change that law to where all gambling acts are illegal over state lines. So now that means I cannot play on an online site in California. Whereas currently, if California and, and New York both had sites, which they don't, I would be able to, they'd be able to share liquidity. Like if you play in Nevada, you're playing with people in uh, Delaware and New Jersey quite often. So anyway, they're trying to upgrade that. So in theory, online poker could be very illegal in the near future. So that is a bit of a problem. But no, online poker is certainly not illegal in America. So stop thinking that. Understand, I mean, this is again, just people not knowing what they're talking about. You must understand what you're talking about. Understand that people out there are just trying to give you 140 characters or a short video on a topic. And it's ridiculous. Why are you not a Borgata? Why would I be a Borgata? I have a new baby. You steer clear of most circuit stops. The Deezer. You clearly do not understand me or my life setup at the moment. I have a baby. I'm not traveling anywhere. I don't need to. We have plenty of money. We don't need to go out there and grind to make money to pay the bills. So we're afforded the ability to stay home and be a father. And also I have a blog on travel. Uh, no, what's it called? Yeah, Travel Rake. JonathanLittlePoker.com slash Travel Rake. Go there. And I explain why I choose the tournaments I play. Essentially, I want to make sure that whenever I'm going to play, I can invest a lot of buy-ins in a short period of time with a decent ROI. If you go to a tournament stop that has, let's say, 13500 and you're great, let's say you're going to have 100% ROI, you're going to make 3500 in five days, which is 700 bucks a day. Okay? Let's instead suppose we go to a big tournament series like um, the Party Poker series they had in... Bahamas recently. If you go there, you can invest, I mean, I think I invested 60,000 in a week then. So 60,000 a week with let's say 25% ROI. That would be 12,500. Is that right? Give or take, call, call it, no, yeah, 12,500 I think. Um, that's 12,500 in the week, which is clearly way better than 700 a day, right? So I'd rather make 700 a day or 1,500 a day. Obviously, I'd rather make 1500 today, which leads to playing bigger buy-in stuff and big series as opposed to individual tournaments or small buy-in tournaments. Are there any US-friendly sites worth playing? No, absolutely not, because they are usually unlicensed and unregulated. Every day I get an email from someone saying, oh, I put my money on this poker site and they took it. And yeah, don't put your money in sites that are unregulated. Sometimes you have to understand you don't get to play. Just because the game exists does not mean that you have to play. How do you project confidence we're all running a good bluff? Just be stoic, Louis Philippe. I think that's usually the best answer. I'm usually stoic in most poker scenarios, and I think it works reasonably well. I think that's a good strategy. Don't be afraid. Don't, don't display your emotions with your face. And also understand that if you're making a big bluff, Louis Philippe, it's because... You know that is the right play because I know you, Louis Philippe, have developed a good framework at PokerCoaching.com. And if you know it's the right play, you should not be unconfident. If you make the bluff and it fails, you should not be thinking, oh, that was a mistake. I should not have done that. You should be thinking, easy bluff, right? You tried to format the button at Borgata yesterday and it worked. A direct result of following my teachings. Good job. Can you be the best player watching... A movie, I have no clue what you're saying. No, you're not gonna be the best player if you're asking me that question. Yeah, Chino's very aware of how his opponents perceive him. Like he has stopped bluffing me. He used to bluff me all the time. Last time we played, it was in a, where was it? I think it was in a 25K or a 10K in Florida. I think it was two or three years ago. 
And he like didn't try, he didn't try to bluff me at all. <laughs> Cause he learns, right? He learns. Okay, Jonathan Little calls literally every time I bet. So I probably don't need to bluff him too much. Do we have something against poker stars? No, not at all. We have a poker stars trophy right up here. Oh, you all can't see it. We have a poker stars trophy right up here. We won. What was this from? 5K six handed turbo. 5K euros, back when euros were a real amount. I happen to not like the things that party poker or that uh, poker stars did to their regular pros by taking away their VIP program. So I definitely do not like that. That said, I mean they do a lot of great things for poker. The tournament they just ran was fantastic. I, I coached um, Nicole Segel for his 25k entry to the PSPC, and that was a lot of fun. He got in because he bettered his life, and I mean, putting out initiatives that Jamie Staples did. He basically challenged people to drastically change their lives because Jamie Staples lost a ton of weight. And Nickel went from being in terrible shape, smoking a lot of cigarettes, his diabetes was out of control, to being in good shape and not smoking any cigarettes and having his diabetes under control. And um, Jamie Staples awarded him his uh, PSPC seat. I love the story. Nickel contacted me because he already studied at PokerCoaching.com, asked for private coaching, and I agreed to do it for free. So he went out there, he had a lot of fun, and I'm very, very excited about that. It's a good thing, right? It's good when you can better people's lives. And if poker in some way helps people better their lives, that's fantastic, right? The fun aspect is big for poker's growth. Yes, poker needs to be fun. Um, the live tournament series have, are starting to figure this out and they're doing more than just exactly hosting a tournament, right? In the past, they would just host a tournament, whereas now they have all sorts of events for the players, which is fantastic. Jeff Gross in the house. Good morning. Hope everything's going well for you. Hello from Russia. Hello, hello. I've never been to Russia, but I bet it could be a lot of fun. Australia banned online poker, and you can only play on unregulated sites. Listen, for people who have a hard time playing online poker because of their country's regulations, understand that you can still play on those unregulated sites. Put a tiny bit of money on there and um, realize you're just like paying an entry fee to get to play against people who play for real. Let's see. I actually tried to help um, make poker legal in America. This is an amicus brief for, our, for the Supreme Court of the United States. I don't know if you all can see that. In this, I, along with a few other poker players, thanks to one of my poker students, Ken Adams, were trying to present Texas Hold'em in a way that the Supreme Court would understand it's not a gambling game. I don't know if they ever read this, but I, along with uh, Mike Sexton, Vanessa Selps, and a few more, presented this little document here to the Supreme Court of the United States of America, but I don't think they read it, because if they did, it would be obvious that um, poker is a game of skill, not a gambling game. We try to help poker to the best of our ability. You can't make people read that. <laughs> you can't get a copy, or you'd love to get a copy. Let's see. Um, Maybe if you look this up, brief of professional and amateur poker players as Amici Curai, I don't know how to say that word, in support of Petitioner, 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 there you go. It's by Ken, Kenneth Adams. It's number 13-564 in the, the Christina case versus the United States. All right, let's see. Going all in feels like gambling. Yeah, sure. That's that's why people think it's gambling. Um, let's see. You saw me playing at Bally's. Yes, I played at Bally's. Where I was, do was I doing it for fun? No, I, there I was at Bally's because I was having a company retreat for me and my employees. And after dinner and a few drinks, they wanted to go play some one, two, no limit. So I went to Bally's. I ended up playing with all of them. It was a lot of fun. How do I do? I won like 100 bucks. Not a ton. What did I think of the games? They were super soft. That said, I was playing with uh, my employees for the most part, and I was flashing around having a good time. Did I play the PSPC? No, I had a baby. Remember, I had a baby. Who is Chino everyone's talking about? His name's Chino Reem. He's been around for forever. He is very, very loose and aggressive. A lot of fun. 
Oh, look, here's the amicus brief. So if you're on YouTube, there it is. Um, I posted it, I think. I don't know if anyone can actually click that. But there it is. What are your thoughts on the Poker Players Alliance? I have no idea. I know um, they were backed by someone who was very, very, very toxic. And they were promoting this very, very toxic person. I'm not going to say who it is. I'm sure all of you know because I have been... I'm, not, I'm usually not against too many people, but I'm publicly against that person. I guess I'm not even going to say it. Because at the end of the day, we're not toxic anymore. Um, we're not trying to diminish anyone's efforts to make poker, quote-unquote, better. But this person was very much against Jonathan Little because Jonathan Little publishes good books. And they were angry that they did not get to be the publisher. So I was a little bit annoyed that they were um, publicizing this person who is actively negative against anyone in the poker community. If you are actively negative and talking trash and berating people in the poker community, I do not think you're good for poker. Especially if it's like reasonable people. I get the idea of like going after scammers and whatnot. But I'm not a scammer. I haven't scammed anybody. And I'm not a bad person, at least in my mind. Maybe some people think I am. But I'm not a bad person. And if you are attacking people like me, understand that it is often to try to bring yourself up to that person's level. Whenever people are hating on people that are doing way better at them in life, it's because they are trying to somehow make themselves feel as if they're on the same level. And anyway, this person's a hater. The uh, PPA was promoting that person, so I just never really gave them much of a thought. It's important to understand that if you are backed by people who a lot of people do not like, you're not going to get support. Can I post it here? Sorry. Yes, here we go. Sorry, I didn't post it for my Facebook friends. Uh, let's see. Do you have any poker playing lawyers helping make poker legal in America? Yes, my student, Ken Adams. He wrote this brief. What did I do to my finger? I just hurt my finger. Patrick Fleming, apparently. I don't know who Patrick Fleming is, but uh, my student, Ken Adams, has done a lot of pro bono work. He is a fantastic lawyer, very, very well respected in, D in Washington, D.C., and um, his work is not specifically for poker, but uh, he, he does lots of pro bono work. Also, Mac Verstandig, he's often working very hard as well. He's my, my regular lawyer who I go to for all of my legal issues, which fortunately are not many. Are 30 minute blinds considered fast? It's all relative. I'm a white hat guy. Most of the poker guys are borderline shady. I wouldn't say most of them are. I actually think most of the people in the poker community are pretty stand up. The problem though is that you never know what people are going to do when they run out of money, they run out of funds, they run out of friends, right? For example, the person who is attacking me, who sponsored the PPA, I know for a fact that his business is failing, right? While he, while he is seeing my business thrive. So how is Jonathan Little's business thriving in the book publishing world while his business is failing? Well, it's because he made lots of bad business decisions and he does not write good content. So if you do that, understand that instead of being disgruntled and angry and hostile, the answer is to try to improve yourselves, right? If you try to improve yourself, realize and look at your competitors who are doing better than you and think, what are they doing that I'm not? And then try to either replicate that or improve on that, become a better version of them. That's how you win, right? If you just keep doing what you're doing and expect it to work forever when it's obviously failing, you're going to fail long term. Let's see, would you lend money to, money to a poker friend? I uh, usually do not. I, I typically don't lend money at all. There are probably five people in the world who I would give a little bit of money to. Five, literally five. My best friends in the world who I've known for 15 years who I all know are well off. <laughs> um, everybody else, no, they don't get any. All right. Louis Flip says he hasn't heard anything negative about me, but then again, he uh, only has time for study and no drama. Yeah. People who are into drama are fish. Simply put. Unless you have a lot of free time. I mean, I don't have a lot of free time, but... If all you care about is who is broke and who is rich and who's the best and who's the worst and who did what to somebody else, I mean, your focus is on the wrong thing and you're probably never going to be very good at anything that takes actual skill. They need to fill a void. Yeah, well, 
Forget your voids. I have to go. Instagram tells me I have 10 seconds left. This was a nice talk. I'll see you today in the Poker Coaching webinar at 2 p.m. Eastern time. It's completely free. Go sign up.